Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Duckworth, and I'm going to kind of be emceeing the event today. Um, we've got an agenda that I'll walk through with you so that everyone knows who is here, who the panelists are. Um, first, we have Chris Bahari, who is the CEO and co-founder of Garland Technology. Also today with us, we have Vivek Panada, who is the Director of Technical Solutions for Nozomi Networks. We have Debbie Lay, a Solutions Engineer with TX1 Networks. And finally, we have Jim Cook, who is the Director of Industrial Systems Cybersecurity for BW Design Group. Uh, and my name is Craig Duckworth, and I am also a Director of Cybersecurity for Design Group as well. So that's gonna be our panelists today. Um, Anything that I missed, lady and gentlemen, that, that you would like to add? I think you forgot to add extraordinaire after my um, introduction. But There's other than that, thank one you. one in every single group. <laughs> always one. So, all right. So we'll kind of go ahead and get started. Um, today's topics are going to be roundtable discussion. So I will kind of send out a topic to the team. They will walk through the questions. Uh, kind of do a, a, a quick discussion amongst themselves about what they are seeing from their perspective, what makes the most sense, kind of how they're viewing it, and we'll kind of move to the next one. So without further ado, question number one. Um, this one's going to go to, to Debbie. What challenges are you seeing with IT, OT engagements as, as TX1 or, or you are, are kind of beginning to look at the at the ecosystem? Sure. From a vendor perspective, I really still see uh, very siloed organizations uh, coming at the OT environment to protect those critical assets. So we get pulled into IT discussions and we also get pulled in by the OT side. And so as we're selling and we're talking about the challenges within those OT environments, a lot of times we need to cross. They need to pull somebody in from IT. And so really by coming in as a vendor, we're helping bridge that gap, those silos that are typically mm -hmm. out there, especially when we go out and we do a, a plant walkthrough. We always want to try to pull somebody in from the IT side it, because many a times they've not been through a plant walkthrough before. So I think it's still very siloed. We're trying to get these teams to work together. Um, to accomplish the goals of protecting those critical assets in OT environments. No, great, great points. Yeah, Debbie, um, you know, one thing you mentioned is the, the plant walkthroughs. And, uh, you know, one thing that we find, you know, can be challenging as well is, uh, you know, when they're trying to identify areas to secure, assets to secure, uh, you know, it's important to help, you know, bring together uh, you know, IT in the conversations, because a lot of times we find the OT side may not really know how the network's set up, how it's configured. Uh, they may not have some of that expertise and, you know, knowing, you know, things like, you know, what type of, uh, you know, wiring is involved, you know, copper fiber speeds, media types. And uh, <clears throat> so we do find that, uh, you know, helping, as you mentioned, sometimes bridging that gap can, can be very helpful uh, when you're, you uh, you know, going into these engagements. And I uh, also want to say, uh, great to be here today. Uh, love to uh, see everybody again. Uh, obviously, we've all done some work together. So uh, really a, a great panelist here. So uh, looking forward to today. Hey, thanks, Chris. I, I'd like to jump in and real quick. Uh, thanks for being here. And just so you know, we just sent a team out for next week. And I think they've got every one of the, the panelists is involved in, uh, in this effort we have uh, next week. Uh, but I want to tack on to what Chris and Debbie were saying, it, it, especially when you're talking about an IT and OT engagement, and everyone uses that term, oh, IT, OT, convergence. And I like uh, to play on that a little bit and say it's a, it, it, I, I always use the IT, OT collision sometimes. <laughs> So, you know, because of those gaps that Debbie was talking about, because of those misunderstandings that are or, or not, just not knowledgeable about, like Chris was mentioning, well, what types of equipment and how is it connected? Um, and, and and again, another play, I was like, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it, they're similar, right? Because it's still network, it's IP, and that's part of the problem. 
and they're kind of well i i kind of call it like cats and dogs living together sometimes you know and and uh uh, you know, they're both animals, but things are done a little bit differently. So sometimes it kind of takes this hybrid approach to, to get that gap, to, to be able to understand, well, what am I looking at and why does cybersecurity matter? And, but I, you know, I'm cybersecurity, but I've never been on the floor. So how do you know what those different devices are with those different protocols, what the different connectivity is? Um, that that's always uh, that's always a challenge as an education in starting any of these things, and it takes time uh, to, to work through um, uh, both sides of the fence to bring it together, so that you can eventually get something that that uh, you know in, you know with the whole portfolio of products that um, it becomes accurate and actionable to move forward. But it, we all have to get both sides working together to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I like the the C words here. So we start with challenges, and you talked about convergence and uh, collision. There are a couple more, right? So one is cultural divide. So the reason why these two teams don't typically are you know are not on the same page is because you know one is prioritizing safety and reliability and availability, right, versus the others that are trying to secure some kind of data. Uh, and networks, if you will. So the only way to overcome that is collaboration. So that's the other C word, right? So the more these two teams get together, and in all my um, successful projects, we've seen that happen where there is one team, right? There's the OT security project, if you will, that has people and representing IT, networking, IT security, the traditional ICS and automation people. They all learn from each other. They all understand uh, what the end goal is, which is risk reduction for the enterprise, as opposed to, you know, thou shalt not touch my stuff. Um, you know, I won't let you touch my uh, network or I won't let you configure my switch. Uh, all, all these, I think, are getting better. Like, you know, compared to three or four years ago, it's definitely a much better place now. Like a lot of um, uh, our customers are seeing a lot more collaboration across those teams. So there you have it, multiple series. Hey, Vinick, that, that was great. They just reminded me of a movie reference, you know, don't touch my stuff. I, did you touch my drum set? <laughs> I don't know if anybody got that in the audience, but it's my favorite. Sorry. Oh, good. No, that's great, great conversation. And, and I can see that from, from each of the sides as, as each of you play a collective role in a, a deployment and engagement in a different look on that OT space. They're all similar in nature. So uh, what you guys are saying definitely is resonating. Let's go to the next question. Um, I'm going to send this one, I think, to probably Vivek. Um, this is, so what are the biggest challenges you're seeing organizations face when trying to implement protection against cyber threats? I mean, part of it is like what Chris started off saying, right? So lack of awareness, lack of asset inventory, lack of visibility to their environments. So if you don't know what you have, it's pretty difficult to figure out the strategy to um, implement protection against any threats, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's usually a second order problem because even yeah. before we get there, um, a lot of people don't have resources and this is a common theme across the board. That's why uh, automation and you know getting consulting help is typically the the starting point for many small to medium organizations because they don't have in-house capabilities. So uh, there are many like it's one of those things where it's death by a thousand cuts, if you will. Uh, but if I were to put uh, you know two big ones up there, the first thing would be you know lack of visibility, and the second is lack of resources. Yeah, and and you you touched on one thing that was really important is you know, this is really step two. You got to know what you have before you can begin protecting it. Go ahead, Debbie. No, I was just going to add to that, depending, again, talking which silo we're coming in and we're talking to customers and engaging with them. You know, if I'm coming in from the OT side and I'm talking to an asset owner or an operator, they're mm -hmm. going to be focused in on that visibility. They have to, you know, know where their resources are, what operating systems they're running, what vulnerabilities are associated so that, that visibility is very critical, but in many cases, they haven't actually gone through a, an actual breach, hopefully in their environment. You know, we, we want to make sure, but if somebody's already been through a ransomware type of attack that impacted OT, 
um, that asset inventory was very helpful for them to recover from, right? And, and they knew that. Well, if I'm talking to somebody from an IT perspective, they clearly understand like the impact and what it takes to recover, you know, the data and having backups and, and all that from a security perspective. But I think both sides need to really focus on is understanding what the total cost to recover. So if you look at an industry, if you are compromised, how many days, whether you know that that's a critical asset and you know that that's the five critical assets that I need to get going first to get my manufacturing back up and going, like what is the cost of those three days or those five days, right? With people, remediation. And, and then you have to think downstream. And I'll give you an example with Clorox. Last year, it's been a little over a year ago. They were one of the first public companies that um, had to file a K-8 report. And we're going to talk about compliance, but you know, that they had a security incident in their environment and it impacted them, their ability. They had to ship product manually for three weeks, which impacted the shelves. So these stores that couldn't get Clorox products on, they didn't leave that space open while they were going through this manual process of three weeks to recover. They filled that space up. And so six months, nine months, even after they recovered their systems and they're back operational, they still have not recovered that shelf space that they lost during that, those three weeks of, of that recovery. So I think both sides can really work together to really understand not just initial, how do I recover? But it's not just data you're recovering, right? This is your business. How do you, you know, recover from the shelf space that you lost during that time? You know, uh, great points, Debbie. And, uh, you know, we run into, you know, a lot of challenges with customers, uh, you know, especially when trying to initially implement, um, you know, uh, you know, I always like to say the truth is in the packets and, uh, you, you've all heard me say that. And, uh, you know, so looking at, you know, I think sometimes, you know, folks just getting started or they're looking to, you know, expand their, their implementations, uh, you know, we find that, you know, a lot of customers have challenges of, you know, figuring out the best way to do that. You know, how can I get my, uh, you know, sensors connected up to my network? And, you know, I always say this is a journey, uh, especially in OT environments, you know, you know, we're not going to accomplish everything in, in, in a couple of weeks. And so, you know, Craig, you and I talked before about, you know, just getting started and, yeah. uh, you know, getting some of that north south traffic first. But uh, Debbie, you mentioned, right, yeah, identifying, you know, what's really critical, where do we start? And, you know, so a lot of times we're, you know, helping, you know, our customers and partners to, you know, look at easy, simple ways to at least get connected to uh, your north-south traffic and then, you know, identify, you know, where, where your big risks are within your environment and, you know, what assets are critical to you. And, you know, let's start seeing if we can, you know, find ways to instrument the network to get that, you know, packet level data from those different areas of the OT network. So, you know, you're, you're getting started, you're, you're at least, uh, you know, hitting a couple of key points of your network and, you know, start gaining the intelligence on, you know, what's occurring, you know, in these environments. So, uh, you know, to me, uh, you know, as you mentioned, like getting your assessments and figuring out what you have, but, you know, sometimes I also think, you know, we can maybe get started a little sooner with, you know, a couple key points in your network. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not waiting another six months or 12 months for someone to say, hey, I need to do a couple site surveys. And you know, you'll have to do that, right, to, to get started. But, you know, so we're, we're trying to help customers, you know, move that piece along a little quicker uh, and, you know, start start diving in and, and learning and, and, you know, working with the different teams to to make that happen. Yeah, I, I'll jump in and just uh, I, I to reemphasize what Chris said. Journey, right? Um, I think uh, I wrote that down when that question popped up. Um, it is not a one and done. It is not go out, turn it on, and you're protected. It's taken it's taken decades to to to, to create this environment. It's going to take time to unwind and slowly uh, work the process to get better. And, you know, we, we time and time again, we go in and the way companies think that it works, 
uh, when I should say they, they think that the way that their network and their machine centers and their control systems are connected, it isn't always the case. There's always, always, always we go out and we find things and say, hey, this is a surprise. This is a, a new unknown. And they got to be ready for it. Right. They got to be ready for it. And you got to have an approach like Chris said to go, OK, well, let's let's go after this and it's going to take time and let's get to this and let's get to the next one. And, and you know, kind of um, um, piggybacking off of what Debbie said, it's like, OK, well, if this is the cost of the breach, let's and you need to set priorities and let's kind of walk through that process, too. Um it's not like we're going to go out and say, well, what you need is endpoint management and boom, you're done. You know, we're, we're not in that world. It is a cybersecurity uh, uh, play, but it's a cybersecurity in that industrial environment. And there's going to be different methods to go and attack that. Yeah, all, all great points. The one thing that I'd like to, to kind of come back and circle up on is, is Debbie mentioned the, the lack of shelf space. The retailers in the Clorox event, they filled that with other competitive product that they had available to sell to sell. Most organizations, when they when they are looking at this, they don't account for what I would call the soft cost or the lost revenue or the market erosion. You know, if they were to they're saying, okay, if our plant's down for five days, we're making a million dollars a day, we lose $5 million. But what they don't recognize is if in that five days, they can't produce product and a competitor to Clorox fills that space and the consumers get used to buying that alternative, it could take Clorox years to make up that lost revenue. And that's something that I don't know that organizations are factoring into their equations. That was a, that was a great call out, Debbie. I was surprised because it was, you know, being from the technical side, I just look at downtime and how quickly can we recover, right? And and then when I did a follow up and I saw like after two quarterly um, earnings statements that they talked about and they were lower than normal, they brought up that point that they hadn't recovered the shelf space, and I was just like, wow, that was a light bulb moment for me. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I and hopefully, organizations that are listening to this are are factoring that into their their calculation when they're trying to determine what would a breach really cost us. And it's not just the downtime to make the product. If you can make the product back up, but you can't sell it, that's a different number. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great discussion. All right. Question three. Um, let's, let's go to Chris. What dynamics do you see shaping industrial cybersecurity going forward? Now, you're a little different in the, the makeup. You guys are a, a hardware manufacturer that enables the solution versus a, a, a solution. So it's, a, it's maybe a little different skew, but how, do, how are you guys seeing this as you are you know, looking at the, at the going forward of the market? Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's definitely interesting time, right? Uh, there, there's a lot of great technologies in this space. And sure. I think I think we all agree that, uh, you know, it's still infancy stage, right? Because, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm seeing is, uh, you know, a lot of folks are just, just getting in the game, right? They're just, you know, monitoring a, a, a very small portion of their network and they're they're trying to, you know, get their hands around the different technologies, understanding how they work. And so, uh, you know, also seeing, you know, some, uh, you know, a lot of investment in, in this space with the uh, different technologies. And, yeah. you know, I, I think, you know, potentially, you know, the next two years, you'll maybe see slight consolidation or acquisitions. Uh, but in terms of the, you know, the technology, I think, you know, there, there's interesting dynamics because, you know, when you think cybersecurity in IT, everything's about, you know, increased speed, increased performance, right? Everybody's moving from, you know, one gig, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig. Uh, so interesting dynamics in the uh, industrial OT side is that, you know, we're, we're still dealing with some, you know, a lot of lower speed technologies. Uh, you know, we're dealing with infrastructure that, uh, you know, has been around for five years, 10 years, 
you know, 20 years. And so, you know, one of the things that, that I see interesting is the dynamic of, you know, matching technologies to, you know, the, the OT environment and, and the speeds and feeds that you're running into. So, you know, if you have certain technologies that are, you know, just continuing to, you know, expand their offerings, but they don't think about, you know, positioning it properly, you know, in the OT sector. So, you know, we're doing some things with, uh, you know, decryption as an example, where we're starting, you know, we, we never really got much interest in the OT space to decrypt data before monitoring it, right? And we're starting to see that, but you can't bring in a 40 gig decryptor, right? Just, you know, you may have, you know, yeah. 100 mags worth of data. So, you know, th these are some things that we're working on and we, we do a lot with is, you know, supporting, you know, things like 100 base FX, 100 mag, 10 mag, 1 gig. And, uh, you know, so I think, you know, the, the interesting piece of this, you know, whole OT sector is that uh, we, we got to make sure that we're staying in line with what customers have. And, and don't get me wrong, there, there's some customers, right, who are advancing and doing 10 gig and, mm -hmm. and higher speeds. But I think, you know, what the majority of us are seeing is, uh, is you know, matching up, you know, cybersecurity, but, you know, doing it in a way that makes sense with, with these types of environments where uh, I think some technologies are just IT Right. They're, they're about, hey, I, I need that 400 gig, uh, you know, uh, technology or 100 gig technology. So that's an interesting dynamic that, that I see a lot. And we're very conscious of it. And, you know, you don't see a lot of tech companies saying, hey, I got this great new one gig product coming out. <laughs> right. But we're, we're doing that right to to meet the needs of the customers and and these environments. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, matching up new tech but making sure right. you can fit it into these uh you know older environments i think is a interesting dynamic uh that a lot of people don't think about no yeah absolutely i i'd like to touch on that uh chris uh you know what you talked about there's legacy there's legacy out there right <laughs> and 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 it's not only just the itot collision really but you've got the legacy that exists because uh, the life cycles are so long in the in the OT world, and you've got the new technology coming in, and so how, how how how's that rub right? How do you fit all these pieces together, and then how do you come up with a a program to address it right? Um, and and I, I, I'll also uh, mention I I always try and tell them there's not a silver bullet out there. There's not a silver bullet that you can go out, get the one thing, turn it on, and you're done. Uh, you know, in that, that in the dynamics that are happening, it's an evolving ecosystem. So how do you put your pieces and players together? And and you know, just like today, how does the TX1 fit with the the Nozomi fit with the Garland uh, to get you that full solution set? And and you've got to have that realization that go, well, one, industrial cybersecurity is an issue, which we touched on the question before. And two, going, OK, if there's no silver bullet, how do I kind of create and put the pieces and parts together so that I can get an effective solution? Right. And whether it's the new technology or the old technology, they're all coming together and, and smashing heads there. Yeah, and Jim, one other point that I just thought of, too, while you're saying that is, you know, the, the other dynamic part here is, right, you have parts of the network run by ABB or Honeywell or different groups. And, you know, the OEMs are saying, you know, this is, you know, our our piece of it. And so those are really interesting is generally, you know, you, you don't go into an IT environment and they say, uh, oh, you know, the, these servers, you know, over here are, are, are run by this this company. You can't touch them. You, you don't hear that, right? It's like, here's right, my data right. center. <laughs> uh, so uh, that that is another, I think, area that, uh, you know, does add an interesting dynamic of, you know, when you're saying, okay, I have to s secure this environment, but these assets are run by, you know, ABB, these are run by someone else. And, and now you got to kind of figure out, well, I'm responsible for the cybersecurity. How, how do I, uh, how, how do I work with those, uh, different right. vendors because at the end of the day i'm responsible to secure it uh but i may be told i can't touch any of that equipment excellent point 
Yeah, and going to that point about not touching it, I think about you know the great visibility tools that we have out there that will show the ABBs and the vulnerabilities associated with that. And so we've got some great visibility tools. I think one of the interesting dynamics that I'm struggling with is just now that I have all that information from visibility, will OT environments ever be able to get to a regular patching cycle? Uh, we, we have the visibility, we know, right? But it's OT. So IT, we've gotten really good with patching and understanding which you know, priorities, which systems we're going to patch first. But in OT, you know, first of all, you know, when are those downtimes? That might only be every six months if you're lucky. And oh, by the way, typically patching is the end of the list. And if they run out of time within that window, those systems don't get patched. Sometimes because of legacy and Jimmy brought this up, there's not a patch available. Right. So that's so an interesting dynamic that as I see all the visibility and the vulnerabilities there, now what am I going to do with it? How am I going to patch? When am I going to be able to patch? Or do I put something in that gives me some mitigating controls like a virtual patching type systems? And, and also, I just wonder from a dynamics perspective, I do see that OT has a very unique environment, different from IT, and that it's more predictable. This robotic arm, this conveyor belt has been doing the same thing for 10, 15, 20 years. We can predict that, right? So to have a system in place that, that can learn those behaviors that it's been doing for 5, 10, 15 years, and then be able to detect and prevent the anomalies out there, I think that that dynamic is going to be interesting to see how all that plays out in an OT environment. Are, is somebody going to take advantage of the fact of that predictability in an OT environment? It is interesting. You all bring up uh, the technical aspects of some of these uh, in industrial dynamics, right? I would like to posit a couple of other things. The biggest thing that I see developing and changing um, is regulation, right? So in terms of what's shaping industrial cybersecurity um, around the world, different governments, different um, regions have recognized critical infrastructure is currently not protected and it's easy pickings. Uh, once the ransomware actors realize um, you know, what can be done, um, and, and oftentimes, you know, like in the case of Colonial Pipeline, where the OT environments were not directly impacted, there were still production um, outages and a forced outage because you know, they couldn't do the billing properly. Um, so I think regulation has become a key driver of assessing cybersecurity risk and mitigating it. The the technical aspects of it, you know, patching is never going to be a solution in OT, right? In theory, uh, it's not even a solution in IT because if you're constantly chasing vulnerabilities, then there's no one sleeping, right? Whether it's the IT team or the IT security team, uh, you should always have built-in resilience, right? So that's another key driver you're seeing um, being addressed around the world as to what would you do? You know, kind of like the Netflix and Chaos Monkey um, principle, where you know you break things on purpose so that you know things are more resilient, and you're not constantly trying to figure out how to patch this next solution. Uh, so even IT is kind of figuring out alternatives there. And OT, that's always been the case, right? Like you mentioned, Debbie, uh, patch might not be available, patch might not be possible to install because there's no outage window. And one of the unique aspect is a patch might not actually solve anything because you patch the HMI, but the uh, unencrypted nature of this old OT protocol they're using makes it still easy for someone to manipulate values, you know, if they're in the environment. So I think the um, the key drivers besides regulation is the push and pull, right? Because we're seeing uh, standards being developed and implementation architecture being standardized across the board. Uh, 62443 has a very good pre and post assessment model and vendors have become on board to um, develop their products in a secure um, process, right? The SDLC, Secure Development Lifecycle, has become a thing, both because of regulation and because of, you know, vendors being uh, asked to do something better, right, compared to what they did 20, 30 years ago. So in my opinion, the bigger picture um, dynamics in industrial cybersecurity are uh, process-driven, regulation-driven, and more risk management-based, as opposed to us chasing, you know, repeating what IT did 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah, if I could, if I could uh, jump on that one again, I, um, Vivek, uh, interesting point where you, you use the term resilience, and I, I, lo I love that term, right? 
because it's, you know, how, how do you address whatever vulnerability might be in the network or in the system or in the devices? Um, uh, you take the IT approach and it's, as, as Debbie was saying, it's patch, patch, patch. Well, you can't do that maybe because of the age, maybe it's uh, because of the dependencies. We had an issue where a client was saying, well, it, you've got a Windows 7 HMI out there on my network. It can't be on my network. Well, you guys, UOT need to go back and, and just upgrade that to Windows 10. Well, that takes all this recontrol effort uh, that has to happen. It's not just I need to buy a new PC and a new license and, you know, a couple hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, I'm ready to go. The recontrol to everything that you mentioned, Vivek, on the back end, uh, uh, there's this cascading effect. And it could be, you know, hundreds, if not more, thousands of dollars to do those things. So how do you create more resilience? How do you, and this gets to, you know, finding those mitigation options and saying, all right, uh, that's that's not the only way to you know, protect it. That's not the only way to change it. You know, how do I go about addressing this particular vulnerability that, that could be very important to me? But, hey, that machine running and, and not spending another million dollars is important to me, too. Uh, so how do you put all the parts and pieces together to address? So uh, and really, that's part of that journey. Right. And going through and, go, well, OK, I've got now that I know I have this. How do I how do I uh, get through that and create more resilience? And what are my different options? Because I am in a different world. Yeah, and I would a couple of things that I I kind of touched on that is you know in 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 Vivek you you mentioned the regulation and resilience and Jim touched on it as well it it goes back and reminds me of secure by design and secure by demand as organizations are requiring regulation is requiring vendors to to develop stuff that is secure you know I was in a a client meeting yesterday and they were talking about devices that they're putting in the field that they are building for a 20 year lifespan. Think of that, 20 years. That's what they're putting out there. And then they're going to maintain them 10 years past that life cycle. So for 30 years, this piece of industrial hardware could be sitting in the plant. And that's okay. But if you rewind 30 years, there wasn't a computer, or there was, but it was minimal. There wasn't an iPhone or a cellular phone. All of the technology that we have today that we did not have 30 years ago, and you fast forward at the speed of technology today, what's that going to look like? What kind of environment are we potentially going to have? And it goes to your legacy devices that are there today, and how legacy will they be in an additional 15, 20, 30 years. So all, all great points. Let's run into a few scenarios. Um, first one, Chris, what value does Garland bring to environments that still have legacy equipment embedded in their networks? Again, it goes back to the conversation we all just had. This stuff has been around a very long time and manufacturers are building it to be there for a very long time in the future. How do you how do you help that? Yeah, so uh, no, it's a great question. And uh, Craig, we uh, you know that's you know one of our specialties here at Garland. So um, you know we have equipment, uh, you know network taps, uh, aggregators, different devices that that make it easy and simple for you to get packet level data. So even if you're in an environment with unmanaged switches. Uh, you know, you have the ability uh, today to start monitoring it and utilizing, uh, you know, in this case, uh, you know, a wiretap. And if you haven't worked with one, uh, essentially allows you to, you know, uh, you know, take two devices. So if you have a, a switch and a, uh, a HMI or switch router, or whatever the, you know, two devices are, you can insert a wiretap in between them, which will, you know, from the wire copy all the traffic to your uh, security and monitoring sensors. And, uh, you know, it's also, uh, you know, space constraints, power constraints. Yeah. You know, you, you can't, you know, you're not going to walk in and just assume that there's going to be a nice uh, yeah. computer room with a 19 inch rack <laughs> and, you know, they got their UPSs and, you know, yeah. it's air conditioned. And uh, so, you know, you're, you're also, you know, have to have equipment that 
you know, can be DIN mounted, uh, you know, standard AC or DC 20 per volt power, uh, you know, smaller footprint devices, uh, also dealing with a lot of media conversion. So we may go in and connect via copper, but uh, you may have to home run stuff back to, uh, you know, main distribution frame via fiber. Uh, you may run into old, you know, 100 base FX LX, which we, we see a lot of that, believe it or not, in, you know, ships, manufacturing, utilities. Um, and again, you know, they're, they're not going to go change that anytime soon. So for us, you know, we really help, you know, look at, you know, ways to, uh, you know, get into these, uh, you know, difficult environments and, you know, some may need, you know, higher temp ranges or, uh, so, you know, we're always looking at uh, developing products, you know, to uh, meet these challenging environments. And uh, of course, right, a lot of times they, they want this in, in cost effective manner. So uh, yeah. you may have a manufacturing facility with a bunch of different, you know, pods that, you know, just have a couple links. Maybe they got a monitor or some substations may just have, you know, one to four links. Uh, so you do need to have, you know, very small footprint products. Uh, that that also meet their budgets and then cost effective. So uh, th those are areas that you know we're continuing to uh, you know help customers with. Yeah, no, and and one thing that I've been in some what I would consider clean manufacturing facilities, yeah. but I'm telling you, the majority of them, as as you just mentioned, are not air conditioned. You don't have nice big pretty racks. You don't have excess power spots. They're tight, they're cramped, they're dirty, they're dusty, they're noisy, and that industrial hardware is is important. No, great, great, Absolutely. great call outs. All right, Debbie, this one's for you. What strategies have you considered to protect legacy systems like XP? We see a lot of XP on the on the plant floor. Uh, uh, so that's that's going to be important. Every, I think everyone can resonate with, with this question. Yeah. And it's a great point because, you know, XP, it's, it's hard to believe that that's still out there, but we've talked about these life cycles and even what we consider modern day OSs will become legacy OSs in an OT environment. So this, this challenge is not going to go away. Mm -hmm. um, it's always going to be there for OT environments. So one of the primary things when I talk about uh, securing XP is to deploy an, an OT agent based solution like NextGen AV that's designed for OT. So it doesn't need to have access to a cloud based environment, right? So we can catch those known attacks, known malware that goes after XP because they still leverage those. They're still out there. That's, that's easy, low hanging fruit for them, right? So that if you put an agent on there so that you can catch those, that's going to help that XP, you know, secure that asset. And then also from that same agent to be able to deal with the unknown, something new that's coming down the pipe that says, hey, I'm going to bank on the fact that this OT environment's going to have some legacy stuff. So I'm going to go after um, that to get a, a, a foothold within the OT environment. But also being able to leverage things like application lockdown for allow listing. Again, leverage the fact that OT, that XP machine's been doing one or three applications for the last 20 years, right? Leverage that, understand it, allow only that type of communication to happen, those applications to do what it was designed to do, and then detect the anomalies. Let me know when somebody's doing something outside of that. But if you can't put an agent on there, and again, um, it could be that the resources are just so tight that you, you don't have anything to put an agent there. Or the vendor says, you can't put an agent on our system. Uh, you're going to void our warranties, so you can't put an agent. Doesn't mean you have to leave that XP machine just out there waiting to be compromised. There's other mitigating things that you can do from the network perspective, like micro segmentation, right? Take that those XP systems and put them on their own uh, virtual segment, basically. And by isolating those, you can say if something does compromise this XP machine, it's not gonna travel what we call east-west, right? Within the environment itself. So you're doing that micro segmentation approach. Also leveraging that network um, solution to provide virtual patching. Look, a lot of people still leverage, if they have XP out there, they probably still leverage SMB to move files around in that OT environment. It's been exploited, we all know that, right? So 
by that networking uh, component to put a virtual patch there that says anybody that's trying to exploit SMB, I'm not going to allow that to happen, right? So you can prevent that from exploiting that XP machine. Uh, you can do continuous monitoring, right? So watch the network, watch the applications, know when something outside the normal is happening and do regular assessments and auditing on that XP um, equipment that's out there. And again, just to summarize, like this is always gonna be a challenge. Uh, if you're gonna deploy an agent, make sure that that agent has the same life cycle and designed for OT environment, not a traditional IT-based solution that follows Microsoft's and IT you know, life cycles of three to five years. It doesn't exist. So you, you really need to look at whatever solution, if you're gonna deploy an agent in an OT environment, make sure it's an agent that's not gonna be obsolete in five years uh, when Microsoft says we're, we're ending you know, support for Windows 10. Um, so those are just some of the things that we take in place and what we consider when we're looking at XP and legacy operating systems. No, great, great, great discussion. And I would say the one thing that you touched on is make sure that the technology and and all of you guys are in the technology space and in the you know the services space in the ot space make sure that what you're doing if for those that are listening make sure that the solution you buy is ot centric do not try and shoehorn an it solution in the ot space it does not work you know so that was a great call out debbie all right Jim Cook with design. After hearing from the others, what are your thoughts on architectural conversations and how does design group amplify those discussions? Okay, I get to, I get to use my don't touch my drum set uh, again reference. <laughs> Thanks okay. for that, Chris. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, where Chris mentioned you got to remember where these guys came from. That's how the manufacturers, and I'm assuming when we say manufacturers, we're talking about the OEMs that have created these systems that are out there on 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 the floor. Uh, they've they've approached it by creating these closed systems. They've tried to keep everybody away from their drum set, but then over the course of time, it has evolved, and they connected up to networks and your SCADASYS and your MES, and now. You're trying to push the the data in and out with um, uh, you know predictive maintenance and all the other uh, fun stuff that's out there from the digit digitization. So we you know they historically didn't consider it and it moved pretty quickly and it moved faster than when we touched on it, the life cycle of the equipment. So I, I you know architecturally I like to you know think about okay now the OEMs kind of have to get into this and say all right, well, you know, you got to be part of the game too, but then, you know, maybe you should consider that security, cybersecurity is part of the way you design these, uh, you know, design uh, secure by design on the way out, at least offer it on the, the way out. Um, because when you get clients that are asking for it, this is why we see all kinds of uh, different types of switching technologies and layer twos. They're they're focused on the machine. They're not focused on the the cyber safety of those machines. That's always falling to somebody else. But can they take it and say, let's offer it? And the, and the clients are going to have to want it too and bring those things together. And if you can say, hey, architecturally, ask your client what what is their strategy where are they going and offer the capability to build it in because uh you know i i, I use this analogy a lot in fact yesterday i said okay we just think about when we went from cars with no seat belts to cars with seat belts it took time but we started building cars with seat belts and started there and eventually we got all cars with seat belts right and, you know, similar type of concept where you, you take it and go, OK, this has taken us decades to get here. So let's start offering seat belts on the way out the door so that the, at least the new ones are coming in and you're starting to turn over uh, in that long term si life cycle. Architecturally, have that capability to, you know, whether you're using the TX1s or the Nozomi's or the Garland's, how do you build that in? on the way out the door um, so that you can provide 
uh, that type of cybersecurity capability on these control systems uh, and machine centers on the way out. No, oh, great, great thing. So before we jump to the vulnerabilities, let's go to a couple of the questions that are that are being posed in the in the chat. Um, that way we can kind of get to some of the thoughts of the of the viewers. So um, let's see. First question. There's a lot of progress in addressing cybersecurity challenges in other domains, cloud, data centers, whatever. And I wonder how much of that could be adopted in ICS domains as well or not. What are the challenges that the ICS industry faces in adopting the research and innovation from the other domains? Are the cybersecurity challenges fundamentally different? You know, Vivek, how about you? Let's see, let's see if you can take that one. Yeah, I would love to. In fact, uh, I've been answering a couple of questions in Q&A and these two I would love to answer live because uh, the author, I mean, the, the person asking the question brings up a great point, right? We do not have to reinvent the wheel. However, ICS security is different. So in terms of how we access asset information, how we identify vulnerabilities, what needs to be priority uh, prioritized, uh, what specific threats are at ICS, those are all different and unique. However, when it comes to higher level, enterprise level uh, risk mitigation, uh, in fact, Patrick Miller has this uh, you know, world famous saying that it's all T. There is no OT, IT, IoT with respect to um, how a CEO or a company evaluates their risk, right? So the risk is, like Debbie was saying before, about operations, about shelf space, about revenue, about profit. These are all key drivers to decision making. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is we are adopting, right? In 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 many ways, um, uh, how do you prioritize, um, you know, what vulnerabilities to pick or, or what uh, virtual or cloud environments you can leverage? Uh, in many ways uh, at that level, uh, it's very similar. So most of the newer software solutions and um, cybersecurity solutions in the OT space are pretty much aligned with what's happening in the IT world, all the way to you know using containers and cloud solutions. Um, in some ways, we're actually more advanced, you know, believe it or not, especially with 3D modeling, especially with AI. That's another question down the lane here, where because again, like some of the previous conversations were about how we are predictable, repeatable, uh, consistent in operations. Uh, we've been using AI in OT for much longer uh, than some of the IT solutions because it's a lot easier to model things and find anomalies based on expected behavior versus what we're seeing out in the wild. So it's not always the case that we have to learn from others. We actually have something to teach as well. So. Great question. Yeah, yeah I, I I just like to jump in on that because I, I, I simplify it to machines talking to machines are a bit more predictable than humans talking to humans, right? And and that, and I think that's what uh, Vivek and, and Debbie, I know mentioned that earlier, you know, learn whatever that baseline, what is the expected type of communication? Um, and, and it brings another value to the ICS uh, cybersecurity space. And it opens up opportunities for the different remediations. Um, and and it, it, I agree, ICS is different. There's unique devices that don't exist out in the world. There are unique protocols. The protocol list is kind of staggering when you start looking at all the different uh, protocols that you have to, to manage and how this different devices and equipments, the PLCs, the HMIs and, and drives and uh, you know your motor controls and your your I/O. How does how does all that work? Well, it's on IP, but they all use different protocols, which are you know not standard IT protocols. So you you need that that specific tool set to address appropriately. No, great great follow up. Thank you. All right, so we've got about ten minutes left, and so I don't get fired from the next MC job. We're going to kind of go through these a little bit quicker because we still have a couple more and I want to make sure everyone gets an opportunity to address vulnerability management as well as compliance because those are both very, very important aspects within what we're all trying to do. So Vivek, how does Nozomi help in prioritizing vulnerabilities for remediation? Yeah, great question. 
Right. We um, are used primarily in asset discovery as a first phase. Then we can match the CPEs to known vulnerabilities, right? So we've been doing this for a long time. So essentially, once we identify all the assets accurately and match them to the NVD for vulnerabilities, we then also add several layers, right? So the CISRS KVE, which is known vulnerabilities, we have a version of it that is in built in the platform so you can then identify what's known right to be exploited out in the wild mm -hmm. and then the exploit prediction um, scoring system epss is mapped to it um, so that at the end of the day you have a list of assets that are not only you know obviously vulnerable but known to known to be exploitable or you know higher scoring in terms of predictability then we map them to what's happening in the environment right whether this is connected to an external IT or an internet facing device, are there other um, aspects in the environment that are risky? For example, other uh, devices that are um, possible to be used as staging, you know, for like a um, command and control server, uh, and then use a form of AI. Again, a question that was asked before, use a, uh, a certain level of um, AI in the system to say, hey, this particular device is vulnerable, it's known to be exploitable. However, you know, where it's installed, it's actually talking a very limited, uh, you know, protocol subset, and it doesn't have, uh, you know, admin access, for example, for that exploit, you know, exploit to, to work, right? So we combine all those things to provide the end users a much shorter list that they can then customize based on their particular impact score to then combine, um, you know, all these different features to identify, you know, which vulnerabilities they want to address in the next outage. So long-winded answer, but we've been doing this for a long time, and our customers have consistently, you know, at, you know, seen a lot of value in identifying, you know, where to start because otherwise, thousands of vulnerabilities are not going to get fixed at any yeah. given point. Perfect, great, great answer, Chris. How can Garland help a customer get started towards decreasing their risk? Yes, uh, Craig, for us, you know, we, we focus on, again, uh, you know, looking at areas within the network that uh, you look at as the, the, you know, the most risk or, or critical assets that we mm -hmm. talked about earlier. So um, for us, it's, you know, really understanding your, your network design, understanding your, your, your layout of the network and, um, you know, looking at ways that you can, you uh, uh, monitor the network effectively and and also understand you know different methodologies so um, you know a lot of people you know continue to use span mirror reports which you know mm -hmm. is a great way again as I say to get started um, but uh, you know th there's definitely you know risks that are taking on there that uh, I think you know customers need to be aware of in terms of you know having uh, the ability to be you know bi-directional uh, you know, if you are using span mirror ports, right, they're configured by an individual, right? People can make mistakes. And so, you know, a simple way to, you know, maybe address a couple, you know, implementations is if you are doing some uh, monitoring of certain traffic via span ports and there's some, you know, critical assets, you may want to look at, you know, putting a permanent uh, wiretap in place to guarantee you're going to see that. So, you're not going to get, uh, you know, someone misconfiguring, um, you know, another thing that if you are using span, you know, I recommend that you, you put together a, you know, good audit process, right? Are you, you know, maybe every six months, you know, going to every switch router that you're using span mirror ports and validating it's actually configured correctly. Uh, did someone, you know, change the configuration? Uh, did something happen during a, you know, a firmware update? Um, so, you know, put in a strategy together that, you know, the way that you're uh, accessing and getting traffic to your security sensors. So, you know, we've done, you know, a lot of work with Nozomi where we're, you know, using span and taps and aggregators and, and getting data. Uh, you know, so for us, you know, I always look like to say, you know, what is your tolerance for risk? Yeah. And, you know, are you, uh, you know, do you understand, you know, what what risks you know come into play if you're using you know span ports as an example or wire taps or a mixture and you know I, I generally see it as you know it's a it's a mixture of approaches that you know allow you to you know continue to 
you know, decrease your risk. So I look at it as, um, you know, where can I get data, you know, to see more assets and where can I get, you know, what I, I'll call kind of deem, you know, permanent access with a wiretap that, you know, no matter what, I, I know I'm going to get every packet and I, I don't have to rely on, uh, you know, me getting the traffic, uh, you know, via span mirror port. So it's continuing to, you know, bring more data into your security and monitoring sensors. So you see more, protect more and, uh, you know, help customers, you know, work on that and, and find the strategic location. So, you know, they can keep budgeting every year to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, increase what they're monitoring and protecting. Okay. No, great, great discussion there. Jim, in your experience, what do you see as the biggest obstacle for companies around handling vulnerabilities? All right. So I, I got to be brief because I don't want to get you in trouble. Um, I'm going to give you one word. It's starting. <laughs> right. Even if you haven't started already, um, you need to start. How are you addressing your vulnerabilities? And even if you are, now that you got all your vulnerabilities, then how do you start prioritizing them? Because it's, it, yep. it, you know, applying it down to the physical world. Remember, we're, we're dealing with digital systems uh, that create physical outcomes. Uh, so the prioritization might be very unique depending on the plant and the operation and the systems and the uh, machinery and uh, what you're producing and what's that financial impact really then needs to, to, to get in there to figure out how to start prioritizing those vulnerabilities. So starting, starting is the key word here. Yeah. I, and to add to that, I would say prioritization, which you touched on, understanding what's important and doing that. But you're right. You, you got to start somewhere. We see so often paralysis by analysis. All right. Debbie, let me ask you this. How do you guys, from a compliance standpoint, see customers handling it? How are, how are you guys seeing them handle compliance? They're trying, right? Everybody has the yep. good, you know, we're security professionals. We're doing the best that we can, but it's a mindset. And if upper management, you know, doesn't have the mindset of security, I don't really know if in the states are compliance, uh, if there is necessarily the way to enforce it that will ever be strong enough with penalties and, and those types of ways of getting around it um, to ensure security without upper buy-in is, is basically what I'm seeing is that, yes, everybody has a framework that they're working from, whether or not they're mandated by you know, the government because they're not oil and gas or they're not energy with NERC SIP, right? We're, we're putting these frameworks, we're trying to design and protect our OT assets. Uh, but again, with in the states particularly, there's not enough teeth from a penalty and from an oversight perspective to make sure that those mandates are actually being implemented in those, those critical areas. Yeah. So it's challenging. It, it definitely is. So the next two, we're going to consider them lightning round. So they're going to go to, to Vivek at Nozomi. Address the different parts of the NIST CSF. Identify and detect, get a lot of attention. How about respond and recover or governor? What's your thoughts? In the interest of lightning answers, I think it's definitely improving. Um, historically, identify and detect were important because visibility and threat detection were the keys when you're starting up. But then, um, like I think Debbie mentioned before, the uh, recover part is important. Obviously, business continuity and recovering quickly so that you don't lose your, your market um, in, in the long run, that's important. Uh, instant response is a big deal. Um, and govern, as you mentioned, you know, it, it's fairly new in terms of the CSF, but the key components of it were already baked in before. So long story short, what we're seeing is people have been asking us, you know, to provide tools to um, 
get these in a better spot than they were before, right? So in terms of dashboards and views. So we've seen a lot of requests from customers asking us for specific views for a governed function so that their leadership can quickly identify you know, where there might be gaps. Similarly, you know, specific alerts and specific dashboards for identifying, you know, what aspects of an incident should be highlighted to the incident response team and what data, you know, BCAPs or others uh, can be easily exported. So um, the tools are already there. I think it's just a matter of maturity in the industry and the customers' environments to be able to take advantage of it. Oh, very, very true. Very true. Jim, last one for you here. If we're working with a company who was mentioned a compliance track or was trying to follow a compliance track, what advice would you offer them to ensure they start and plan correctly? I think you're on mute there, Jim. All right. All right. There you go. All right. I'm 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 going to go with uh, the capabilities, right? OT cybersecurity capabilities. Uh, Vivek mentioned it earlier. It's about the resources, right? That's a challenge there. Uh, you could, you know, that you need uh, that capability it, that these resources. That, that have these skill sets to go in all these different environments, to have that versatile skill set to, to be able to put it together because interpreting how that compliance uh, tracks to their unique environment will be changing. So, so make sure you have that. And if it's internal or it's external or it's a mix or however you wanna go, that, that role and responsibility and those resources are important to really uh, understand the proper way to address your compliance. No, very true. And I know that we're, we're a little bit over on time here, and I apologize for that. We had several questions come in throughout the course of the webinar, and I know we answered a couple of them live. All those that we did not get to, feel free. We're going to reach out and make sure that the questions are all answered to the individuals that asked them. Um, so we appreciate it. Um, if there's anything else, don't hesitate to reach out to anyone on the webinar here. We can help with any questions, any answers that you have. Uh, we appreciate your time today. Uh, back to you, Caitlin. All right. Thanks, Craig. And thank you to all of our speakers, again, for the really great conversation. And as a reminder to everyone, this will be sent out uh, as a recording uh, probably early next week. So all of that information will be made uh, viewable to everyone on the call. And again, thank you for your time. And Craig, thank you for being such a great host.